And last but not least, we have Michelle, who will guide us in more of a discussion. And sorry, I have it. I did not bring my little bio up, but Michelle is a research manager. Yeah. Sure. Who cares about the material impacts and how people think about them in the context of repair? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Michelle. Oh, sorry. You wanna, you wanna cut that? Yeah. And just while Michelle's um, setting up, I'll say a couple of things. If anyone is still on our stream, where we had some folks earlier today, we're gonna stream for a portion of Michelle's presentation, and then as we move into discussion, we'll say goodbye to you. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, for everyone who's in the room, um, once Michelle finishes, um, we'll come back, I think, and do a bit of a group share out after that discussion. And I just have like a short couple of minute like goodbye. Um, and then later on, as I mentioned, um, we're gonna do an after par party. Um, so I hope to see you there. We sent the details in the emails and I'll describe them again. Hello. Hi, my name is Michelle. I am a program manager at the Share. We used. Okay, I was fiddling with the cord. I am a program manager at the Share Reuse Repair Initiative. Um, that's a small nonprofit uh, based in BC, and we do work around the circular economy, particularly around these practices of sharing, reuse, and repair. Um, so essentially, I spend a lot of my time bringing together local government and community organizations and businesses um, across Canada, but maybe mainly in BC, um, to talk about the materiality of our things and try to get pe encourage people to kind of change their mindset around our, um, uh, the material impacts of our consumer culture. Um, and in the other part of my life, I am a recently graduated uh, doctoral student um, from UBC, um, from the School of Information, um, where I did research with community-based repair groups in Metro Vancouver. So I'm here not, I, I, I've understood maybe like 60% of the words that have come out of people's mouths today. And um, I am hoping through this discussion that I will learn a lot more from you. Um, but I've, I'm really intrigued by this idea of permacomputing. I come out of the information sciences, I'm trained as a librarian, and I'm interested in kind of how people reckon with the material impacts of their information infrastructures and their computing practices. Uh, so, um, to begin then, um, also grateful to have carried out all of my work on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, from whom I benefit as an uninvited guest here from the UK, and from whom I continue to learn, not least of which about the messy work of repair um, that is ongoing. So here are my starting points for you. Um, I am thinking about uh, kind of my work with the Share Reuse Repair Initiative often means being continually confronted by the ways in which we are complicit and implicated in um, our stuff and our need for stuff. Um, and in my work around computing, that has largely been around e-waste. We know that uh, kind of we produce 54 million tons at least of e-waste every year. Um, we also know that 80% of the carbon that's related to our computing practices is embedded in the devices that we manufacture. So, you know, we can talk about uh, energy efficiency and those kinds of things, but the fact is when I buy this device, already 80% of the emissions have happened in the mining of rare earth minerals, in the flying things around the world to put them together, to take them to another place, to put them together because the labor is cheaper there. So 
uh, I kind of came into my research at UBC thinking about how are people trying to do things differently with their information devices? How are people also navigating the uncertainty of the climate crisis? And engaging with different community groups um, who were uh, kind of looking at issues around climate crisis, community resilience, repair, emergency preparedness, and um, thinking about, okay, what can we learn about from the people who are already trying to develop information and computing practices that are maybe less extractive, less wasteful, perhaps even regenerative. Um, so in my uh, work since, that has really blown open beyond computing devices to thinking about consumer goods in general, all of our uh, kind of household devices. And I'll uh, speak a little bit more about that as well. But my plan for the session today is to kind of give a small introduction to pyramid computing um, to focus on one pyramid computing principle, which is care for the chips. Um, and then to share a little bit of my work uh, with repair groups before handing it to the room where um, I would really kind of love to hear from you and hoping that we can kind of have a discussion together, um, probably in small groups, and then we can come back around. So my, my goal is that you will be hearing less from me and more from each other in the rest of this session. In our starting to think about pyramid computing then, um, in the other, another part of my life, um, I am quite involved in co-ops. And in particular, I, I live in a housing co-op. I'm on the board. It's a, uh, it's a whole thing. Um, <laughs> Consensus-based decision making is like a, um, a fun thing that I could talk about for a long time. But that is not the purpose of this talk. Uh, and we have a community garden. And a few years back, I decided to do a permaculture design course. Um, so I kind of did this based on um, my involvement in the garden. I knew that my housing co-op was built in the 70s and it was built with permaculture principles in mind. And so I was kind of curious um, about permaculture. So I can share a little bit more going into um, kind of where permaculture comes from and then shifting into permacomputing. Uh, so, f who is familiar with permaculture as a principle to begin with? Probably like half, more than half. Okay, so um, permaculture, this was an approach developed in the late 70s as uh, kind of a, a reaction to industrial agriculture. And uh, it's an approach most simply about land management and settlement design. And it uh, kind of looks to patterns that we observe in flourishing natural environments and seeks to design systems that replicate that. And so there are a number of uh, principles associated with uh, permaculture around responding to change, observing and interacting with the environment as a kind of a holistic entity um, around uh, producing as little waste as possible, ideally no waste. Um, so lots of emphasis on uh, composting. And I can tell you about my compost system a little later. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so uh, this kind of, this idea emerged about um, kind of how we can reimagine uh, the ways that we produce food, but really permaculture principles are designed to be applied to any kind of systems thinking. Um, and so I've seen a, a great example recently of someone who did a permaculture analysis of their wardrobe um, around like, where do my clothes come from? How are they organized? How can I kind of um, uh, get a yield from them over time? Uh, those kinds of like ways of thinking about systems and analyzing systems with these kinds of uh, regenerative and resilient approaches in mind. So permacomputing, it's been mentioned a few times already today. Um, and 
it's kind of a, a concept and a practice or a community of practice that is emerging, um, draws inspiration from permaculture and the, this uh, kind of understanding that it's better to think about systems in this situated, regenerative, resilient, hopefully positive future kind of way. Um, so where permaculture seeks a more holistic and uh, ecologically harmonious approach to um, a kind of alternative to industrial agriculture, permacomputing, then we can think about, okay, dominant approaches to computing. Um, how can we think about uh, ways of computing that are uh, less extractive, less growth oriented? Um, and I think many of the conversations here today have already been doing that. So this is not um, to say that this is like a new and different approach to the conversations that we're already having. It's more like, how do we, what do we recognize from this in the work that we're already doing today? Um, also, it um, kind of connects to a number of different other communities and communities of practice. So uh, things like collapse informatics, designing systems um, for uh, the end of the world, um, or other kinds of uh, breakdown. Uh, and as well, the limits in computing workshop um, if anyone in this room is unfamiliar, I encourage you to uh, look them up. Uh, they do stuff, it's a, a yearly conference around uh, computing practices within planetary limits. How do, we, how do we apply limits to our understandings of computing? Um, so in particular, permaculture inspires permacomputing in ways that kind of recognizes the effects of computing on the biosphere, trying to find ways to make these effects more positive, more regenerative, um, turning waste into resources. How do we rethink what waste is? Because waste is really like weeds. Waste is a category that we kind of apply to things. How do we um, kind of... Uh, how do we narrow our definition of waste and make use, to, make use of things before they become waste? Um, turning constraints into possibilities. Uh, this kind of more um, imaginative, creative, positive attitude towards sustainable design. Often the conversation is around what we cannot do um, or returning to the past, or having less, less resources, or not being able to do things. And so how do we reframe that conversation into something that is more about a positive future? Um, and uh, kind of, I guess, opposition to a mainstream uh, technological industry, um, and providing like real pragmatic tangible examples of how that could look different. Um, and then finally, kind of increasing resilience and adaptability, recognizing that um, uh, like with Esther work, Esther's work and others that have been mentioned today, um, these kinds of systems that we can imagine can build resilience and emergency preparedness, particularly um, around as well as reducing the impact on the, is causing these emergencies these forest fires or the um, other kinds of disasters that are causing um, these less resilient systems to fail so like permaculture permacomputing also has principles um, there is a uh, I've put the website there because there is much written about each of these principles and I tried to print them out to share with you and it didn't, it wasn't a good use of paper. So um, I encourage you to go look them up, um, read a little bit more about them. Some, like with permaculture, uh, some pr these kinds of principles can start after a while to read a little bit like fortune cookies um, or horoscopes. But uh, I encourage you to kind of think creatively for the purposes of this discussion and think about the specific work that you're doing and how these principles show up um, in 
or could show up in the work that you do. Um, and so to ground that then, I was going to invite, because Damien mentioned that some of the work that you do is uh, based in permacomputing perma principles, and so I thought that I would invite you up to maybe speak a little bit about some of these principles and, and how they apply to your work. Yeah, so it was kind of funny when I read the principles page for the first time a few days ago. I was like, oh, we do that, we do that, oh, we really feel strongly about that. And uh, yeah, probably, uh, I mean, even in order, all of these, the care for life, obviously, by reusing and recycling stuff, we're not throwing stuff in the landfill. And yeah, the care for the chips, I mean, the big one is hardware lasts pretty much forever, especially that server hardware I was talking about. You, know, you can buy a used server, it'll run for 10 years. Um, so there's a lot of reuse that can be gained there. Um, it's really just a matter of running the correct software. I mean, if you take a, a server that was running Windows and is now too slow and stick Unix on it or stick Linux on it, you can get another five to 10 years out of it. If you then take it and stick OpenBSD on it, you can get another 10 years out of it. Um, I've got OpenBSD running at home on like a power PC, like MacBook, just for the hell of it, because it, it works and it's current and it's still secure. So there's a lot of, of, of savings to be gained, um, as well as you know diverting stuff from the landfill by reusing old equipment and by upgrading it along the way. So we we typically will buy these used servers on eBay for like anywhere from like three to five hundred bucks, and then I'll pick up a CP, uh, look up the server and figure out what the best CPU I can get for it is. Head over to eBay again, and it's like some guys selling it from Saskatchewan. Two of them wrapped up in bubble wrap for 30 bucks, and then you buy a round kit from somewhere else and max out the round. And end of the day, for usually about 2,000 bucks or less, I've created what would have been you know, a $30,000 server where you buy it maybe five years ago. And then running open source software, running Unix on there, we can make that thing last easily for another five years in production. And it's still got life beyond it after that. And when we're done, we don't throw them out, we sell them or give them away. And people are invariably stoked when they get the old gear because it still has years of life left. There's a lot of uh, satisfaction to be gained by doing that as well as, as like the dollars and cents of the thing, um, if you're into that sort of thing. And uh, let's see what else here. All of these things really. So kind of part and parcel with, with like using the Unix is to keep it small philosophy. So again, if you don't overcomplicate things, they're going to last a lot longer. They're going to be a lot more resilient. They're going to be a lot less fragile. And uh, for us, that's really easy to do because of our workload. So we're, we're very fortunate in that basically what we do is create the same environment over and over again for lots of little customers. We don't have the problem where like somebody needs to connect two servers together because nobody's got a website big enough that uses more than one virtual server. And I mean nobody. Like we hosted the Unclaimed Property Society in DC and they would literally go on the six o'clock news and say, there's free free money at this website. And the whole province would show up at once and like try and collect the money. And with the correct caching and software in place, we were doing that on a four gig VPS. No problem. So I mean there's there's these incredible gains of efficiency that can be made um, just by approaching things in a different way and not necessarily you know, following the Pi Piper song of what the very latest technology is. And that actually dovetails into, where is it? I guess that's build on solid ground. I mean, a big part of build on solid ground is to not get too ambitious about new stuff. And uh, certainly new stuff's very exciting, but if you're, if you're gonna rely on it for infrastructure, new stuff is very dangerous too. And, um, that was talked about earlier when you, you know, you put all your stuff into some cloud app and then all of a sudden, you know, one day they decide we're killing that app and it's gone. And that's actually happened a few times for infrastructure, not just apps. Um, I think there were a couple times Adobe yanked some old infrastructure and I know Google and Microsoft have both done it. Um, there's a Microsoft one, I think, that was some kind of like uh, web TV or something where they just killed it and everybody was long into it. Actually, I think Microsoft's the most famous for doing that. They court all the vendors, get everybody into it and be like, oh, we're not really feeling it. We're turning it off next week. Um, so yeah, you, you have to you have to temper the desire to run all the new stuff with the, the pragmatism of running stuff that's established. And much like the hardware lasts forever, there's certain software projects that last forever that are ubiquitous and that are hard to imagine will ever die. Like uh, MediaWiki is a good example. There's something that pretty much the entire planet knows how to use. You can run it in like 30 gigs of RAM or 30 megs of RAM, pardon me, on a, a small Raspberry Pi or something, and put one of those things up, and it will work forever. It'll last for most of your life, hopefully. Uh, 
uh, see what else we've got here. I suppose everything's a good one that we, we plan to do from the beginning and not really succeeded on very well, but our ultimate goal is to figure out this entire end-to-end -end system and then open source the whole thing. Here's all the software, here's all the hardware, here's all the know-how, um, in the hope that in, a, in true cooperative fashion, everything starts doing it. Uh, what else? Hope for the best, prepare for the worst is probably good life advice for anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, again, especially if you're providing infrastructure or you're relying on technology, if you're going to replace the, the magically always on cloud in your life with something you're doing yourself, um, you should be planning for, for the worst, which is stuff like that backup testing role playing I was talking about earlier. Um, I'm like, hmm, amplify awareness, get stuff shared and everything. Miss anything? Keep it flexible. Again, that's, that's fairly obvious. Um, and like, that's the thing. All of these things are extremely common sense approaches that aren't common practice. And the reason for that is the common practice is being written by the people who are to make the most money out of the common practice. So it's, it, it's a little bit of thinking for yourself and it's definitely a little scary, but it's 100% worth it in my opinion. So yeah, okay, good. <laughs>I think we can kind of approach these principles as like a work in progress and tools for thinking with. Um, and I've already seen a lot of alignments uh, or I've, I've kind of heard the principles come up a lot today already, whether it is kind of talking about the, the possibilities of using constraints, constraints with uh, small files um, and, and small file media, like what does that add when you, when you create that limit for yourself? Um, definitely uh, when Neil was talking about your website, everything will break, design, design for descent. Um, that got me thinking about like, uh, I don't know, code composting or like <laughs> composting computers, like how do we um, think about the breakdown of something over time and, and what that adds or uh, kind of how that breaks down in like a, um, in a meaningful way or in a regenerative way. Um, and the local first and thinking about minimizing waste has been a theme that has come up all day. Um, so for the purpose of the, purposes of this discussion, because these principles seem to be very applicable to a lot of the work that has been mentioned today, I thought that it might be uh, good to focus the discussion on uh, one, uh, which is care for the chips. And this also gives me an opportunity to talk about some of the research I've done. Um, so care for the chips then. Um, production of new computing hardware consumes a lot of energy, as we have discussed. So how can we think about maximizing the lifespans of hardware components, um, particularly in an environment where we are taught to aspire for the newest thing, for the most novel thing, and, and in a space where technology is, the narrative of technology and the rhetoric of technology is so often about the cutting edge, um, how do we think about what could be new and novel and cutting edge with the stuff we already have, the things that we already have. Um, so there are some kind of examples there from the uh, permacomputing uh, principles website around what that could look like, but I encourage you to kind of uh, think beyond that as well. And in order to get that going, I thought I would uh, kind of share some of my work that I did with repair cafes um, who is familiar with the term repair cafe? Most people. Uh, who has been to one? Few people. Great. Uh, so through my research at UBC, um, I became interested in the folks who were trying to kind of do things differently initially with their um, digital devices and computing equipment. Uh, but that quickly expanded to think about like what is repair information and how do we, um, why would someone volunteer their time to show up to a community event to help you, a stranger, 
uh, fix a broken toaster that you could replace for like, I don't know, 15 bucks very easily and conveniently. Um, so, and these repair cafes are kind of free community events. Volunteers are there, um, often from different repair-based organizations, um, often held in libraries, community centers, and uh, as long as you can carry it, and as long as it's not like a, a combustible engine, um, they will try to help you fix your stuff. So people bring jewelry, people bring computers, people bring uh, kitchen appliances. The first time I went to a repair cafe, there, someone had brought their accordion, and this poor engineering student was like being like, I can have a look at it for you, uh, sure. Um, so I just, I love the positivity of that and the optimism. Um, and they, I first kind of became interested in repair cafes around 2018, 2019. They were growing in Metro Vancouver. Um, there was more and more interest. Folks were kind of turning up and queuing for multiple hours to participate in a repair cafe. And I found that I was just so intrigued in an age where there's a lot more how-to videos on YouTube. There's repair information is kind of, um, it is in so many ways like inaccessible. Um, and things in so many ways are built to break and not be repaired. And that's kind of a conversation that we could have. But uh, it, in many ways, it is easier than ever to find information about how to repair the thing that has broken. And so I was very interested in these like in-person community events. Uh, and I stress in-person because um, I planned to start my research in the spring of 2020. And I had planned a lot of public engagement activities. We were going to do arts together. I was going to hang out and meet the public. Yeah, it was going to be great. Um, yeah. Uh, so very quickly, my, uh, my research became more meta than I ever thought it would be, as I was trying to repair my research, which had fallen apart in front of me. and. Uh, the folks that I was connecting with at these repair events were trying to repair their repair events because they couldn't meet in public either. Um, and uh, the, amidst these kind of constantly adapting and changing restrictions, as well as that, um, it's hard to remember now, but that sense of real danger for yourself and your loved ones and that responsibility to keep the, whether it be your volunteers or your participants, safe in that environment. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was an interesting time, but it was also an opportunity because, uh, so I ended up interviewing and speaking a lot with people who um, organized or volunteered at the repair cafes, not so much people who participated in them because there won't, were no people showing up at that time. Um, but they were already reflecting on what they were missing about these events because they couldn't participate in them. And so it was a, like, in some ways, a very good opportunity to think about what people choose to sustain and hold on to when they can't do the whole thing. Uh, when things are breaking, what do you choose to sustain? It tells us something about what you find important and what you care about. So this is kind of how I'm connecting it to caring for the chips. Um, and I thought that I would just share um, a few different stories of um, different ways of thinking about repair that I explored in this context and at this time um, and how kind of care, the, the idea of caring for the chips relates to that or could be understood differently. Um, so firstly, uh, as um, the, the, the organizers were tr kind of trying to shuffle around these different public constraints um, and different health uh, things and safety plans and all of that, um, I spoke to them about the alternatives of like, OK, so you can't do an, an in-person public repair cafe. Uh, 
and they were like, yeah, well, you know, we could do it on Zoom. Um, and we could do like a drop off service where people bring their broken stuff and then we repair it and then we give it back to them. But that's really like, that's the whole point is the social interaction. Like it's really not about the stuff that we're fixing. Um, it's about the kind of uh, the interactions that we have with people and it just wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the thing that we're trying to do if we created a drop off service that was uh, kind of um, long distance. So, and in many ways, in a, when it's in a public context, repair can be this kind of compelling spectacle. So if you ever have the chance to go to a repair cafe, you'll notice that, um, uh, that it's kind of like an operating theater where people will gather around the tables um, and they're not, the, they're not the fixer and they're not the owner of the thing, but they're just kind of curious observers and spectators seeing you know, how the fixer can kind of um, go up against these, like, uh, the forces of breakdown and decay uh, with their skills. Um, and uh, it's, <laughs> uh, and so all of the participants that I spoke with described the social value of their repair work that they were engaging in, um, either for themselves personally or for their community more broadly. And for different participants, repair work opened up a space for community connection or personal healing or intergenerational learning, um, such that the value of the work wasn't so much in repairing the things, but repairing things together. Um, so examples would be folks who used to be teachers, and I spoke to a lot of repair, um, a lot of retired repairers. Um, pe people who used to be uh, teachers and they were so used to spending all of their time with kids, teaching kids things, and then they retired and they don't have that social, those social connections anymore. They don't have that uh, interaction and so they got involved in the Repair Cafe because it was an, an opportunity for them to connect with people from different generations and to share that knowledge and feel valued for that knowledge. Um, and. Uh, one of the things that uh, one of the organizers said was um, that she felt like they were restoring value not just to the objects but also to the people. Um, she said that each person who came in was a whole new adventure and a whole new story and a whole new challenge to see if they could fix this thing. So there was like um, such a social component of this um, of this environment that folks were really missing during the pandemic when they couldn't participate and. They also talked about all of the work that they put in to make these events social and welcoming spaces. Um, so that would include like walking up and down the street to passers-by and being like, hey, did you know there's a repair cafe? Do you know what that is? Um, or organizing activities for the people who came and had to wait for a long time. Uh, so they had like a pull-apart table um, where old broken electronics, you could just like take them apart and look inside and kids and grown-ups love that. Um, uh, they had refreshments for people. They, every time something was successfully repaired, they would ring a bell and everyone would clap. So like this is um, more than just uh, the, the practical work of repairing things. It was uh, kind of this feeling of being a part of something that actually a lot of design work went into creating um, and a lot of labor went into creating. And it's perhaps not so surprising given the historically entrenched divisions of labor that there was a gender dynamic present um, at least in the people that I interviewed. So those who were repairing the objects were um, for the were entirely male presenting, mostly white. Um, and this more social organizational work was carried out by women and people of color. Um, and this kind of uh, work doesn't really feature these, like what we think of when we think of traditional repair, like these tool wielding fixers embodying this idea of, of kind of, uh, yeah, repairing things. And so 
but that, that organizational and that social work really created the conditions for this repair to happen. And so when I'm thinking about permacomputing principles and I'm thinking about thinking holistically about what repair work is um, and the conditions that we create, the environment that we create for that work to happen, I think that's kind of an important piece to look at as well beyond the, um, like the engineering work that is taking place on the work table. So another part of thinking about repair was also thinking about not just repairing our stuff, but repairing our relationships with stuff. Um, a lot of why people were motivated to take part was around this frustration with the system. Um, and so uh, this particular person that I spoke with um, was kind of talking about capitalism and manufacturing and this kind of consumerist system that is so wasteful and how once they started seeing that waste they really saw the disconnection between themselves and their environment embodied in their um, kind of electronic things um, because they didn't know where their stuff came from they didn't know they didn't feel like they were valuing their stuff in the same way because they didn't know uh, anything about it. They didn't know the processes that made it or where the materials came from. Um, and uh, it's, it felt like very um, disconnected from their actual experience of having the thing. Uh, we rarely think about, you know, all of the hundreds of hands and different countries that have touched these devices before they get to us. Thinking differently, another way of, of thinking about our relationships with things. I don't know if anyone has seen the BBC show, The Repair Shop. Um, it's like the Great British Bake Off, but for like broken pianos and things. Um, and in terms of thinking about stories of repair, this show like has it all. It's, there's usually an heirloom of some kind. It's, there's a personal story about why it's important to them. Um, something has happened to that thing or it's been, you know, a puppy has chewed it or something. And uh, it, um, repair of that, the, the care that goes into repairing that thing is justified by the story of sentimentality that goes along with it. And I saw some of this too in terms of the stories that people had about the things that were brought into the repair cafe. So here's one example. Um, uh, one of the organizers was reflecting about the stories that were attached to the things that people brought in. And they had this example of um, a, uh, a ceramic coaster that someone had brought in that was cracked. And one of the fix fixes helped them glue it back together and it turned out that it was a house plate from their home in Yugoslavia, one of the few things they were able to bring with them when they were fleeing the war. And this was like a story that really impacted um, this person because uh, it showed kind of the, how important this object was for this person that they would kind of come out on a busy day, maybe wait in line for hours for someone to help them to repair it. And this is quite typical uh, in storytelling about repair. We hear a lot of these kinds of um, the repair shop style stories. And, but I want to kind of challenge this perspective when we're thinking about computing because uh, I cannot, we can try to imagine a version of the repair top shop TV show where people bring in like their broken servers and their their broken down kind of uh, computing equipment, but things can be important not just for sentimental reasons. And uh, it's repair really asks us to acknowledge that all that we have a relationship to all our things and that that also deserves care and uh, kind of a responsibility to care for things. So this means kind of uh, recognizing um, the material objects that we have beyond just these like treasured items that might feature uh, on a very sentimental TV show. 
So then the last uh, kind of story I have is um, kind of repairing within constraints, repairing within capitalism, perhaps. Um, and as is probably already evident, both from the conversations we've had in the room today and also from some of the voices of, of these participants, many uh, people I spoke to around repair re framed it as a political act, um, that they were pushing against capitalist and consumerist logics of growth and profit. And uh, local repair initiatives and other kinds of volunteer-driven community groups are often celebrated for their caring atmosphere um, that they can foster. But we're also reminded by the many scholars of care that uh, care as labor is often romanticized. Um, so it's often kind of expected to bring this inherent fulfillment, justifying its underinvestment. And so when we think about care and caring for the chips, I also want to kind of think about the labor of caring for the chips. Um, and a lot of the conversations I had with folks around that time, particularly going into the pandemic, um, was around the tensions and contradictions and kind of pragmatic decisions that they had to make in their work where they were, had this challenge of aligning their ideologies with the, a financially viable organization. Um, so uh, this one participant was explaining this kind of challenge because they were an organizer who was kind of trying to make uh, this repair cafe model viable um, and sustainable, but they were very cognizant of the fact that they were relying on volunteers in order to do that. And a lot of the work was, hap was being done by volunteers. So it was a strange mix of like, they said, it's not necessarily a slam dunk for everybody. How do we work our model and make an impact and create connections in our community at the same time? And we so often separate our business and our communities that it's hard to kind of bring those two things together in a way where you're doing something good for the community, but yeah, you also need to make a living. You need to put food on the table. And how do I do that in an ethically, um, in an ethical way where like, I'm also able to communicate that and people understand and support it um, in a sustainable way. So, I think this theme has come up a number of times through the conversations today as well. Of like, how do we um, how do we create this alter these alternatives? Um, so often they are off the side of our desk, or they are kind of passion projects. And how do we make those sustainable in the long term? How do we think about kind of um, the work that goes into that, and how we can kind of keep that going? Um, in a way that doesn't include burnout. Um, uh, so on that note, uh, I would like to kind of present that as like my expanded vision of what caring for the chips could mean. Um, but also I've heard it many in many different examples throughout the room. And I'm fairly confident that if we break into small groups, there's gonna be at least one project in each, uh, in each little um, group where you can uh, discuss this idea of caring for the trips and permacomputing in a little bit more kind of uh, grounded in the work that you're doing. And so I have a few questions uh, that I would love for us to discuss or to get you started. Um, I th also am very open for groups to take it in the direction that they want. I know that there was uh, the um, Wi-Fi planning activity that Esther suggested, and I feel like this could also be wrapped into this conversation, so I encourage you to kind of uh, use the time in that way too. Um, but if we spend like 20 minutes, half an hour uh, on this, and then come back and share some things at the end, uh, but I would love to stop talking and hand it over. But I don't know, Dawn, do you want to do some stuff first? Okay. No, that's great. great. Okay. So I'm going to suggest that you self-organize um, huddles wherever you're sat, or if you feel like you've been sat next to the same people all day, get up and move. Uh, that's okay too. 
Um, but how many people? Self-organized. 